Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, going to share with you some of the biomarkers that we are on the cusp of hopefully revealing. Um, and having leveraged off the and being inspired by the findings in, in cancer, we were, have been puzzled over the last 30 years why they haven't been replicated in the brain. So the conventional wisdom, of course, has been that with 85 billion highly interconnected neurons and 85 billion glia and over 100 chemicals sloshing around, and most of those genes being represented, highly represented, in psychiatric illness, maybe this was just a problem that was uh, intractable in the main, and so many replications in the molecular side of the study seem to be pointing in that direction. But as integrationists, which is what we are, we thought maybe if we expand beyond measuring the molecular or the omics to measuring everything about the brain and standardize so we have the power of numbers and then find people to back huge studies, you know, 10, 20 million dollar studies maybe with the right hypothesis generating ideas we may be able to find some biological markers. I suppose the other thing, before I show you some examples, is we have been surprised in looking at this database that despite the inordinate complexity, I mean the complexity that we see today at the molecular level, every speak, speaker today has emphasized the heterogeneity of what they've been talking about. So we see that at a whole brain scale, of course. However, the brain seems to have evolved some adaptive processes that supersede this complexity and seem to be, there seem to be a small number of factors that explain a large amount of the variance. So let me give you one simple example. Could I ask you by, by show of hands, how many of you in this room think that you have a negativity bias? That means that when you get a threatening piece of information, you may tend to magnify it, magnify its importance to you. Would you mind showing me by way of hands how many of you think you have negativity bias? Okay, how many of you have the opposite? That when you get a piece of information that could be threatening, you recontextualize it very quickly and almost automatically and see it in a more positive light. Would you mind showing my show of hands? So you can see, by way of show of hands, the negativity bias wins. And it's from them that you find, if it's extreme, that you can get the catastrophizers. How many people in a team does it take to put ink in the water and make everybody around them really nervous? Anybody got an idea how many people that takes in a team, in a group, in a company? One. Why? It's because we are predisposed to tune in non-consciously to threat. Now, this is not an esoteric concept. This is not psychology. This is hard-wired biology. This is your amygdala fight or flight system being triggered deliberately to scan your environment for threat. That is the ultimate biomarker. And just in the database, it turns out 15% of people have a high negativity bias, 15% a high positivity bias. We've got a, one of the databases of 1,500 twins. It's highly heritable. The good news is that you can change it if you want to. So what we really have developed over the last 30 years is a standardized, integrated platform to try and find biomarkers in psychiatry at an unprecedented speed and with unparalleled efficiency. So this is really taking everything we've heard this morning, all the biomarker, wonderful, omic, phenomenal outcomes, but adding to them neuroimaging and cognition so that really it's the interplay between these genomics and brain measures that may more likely elucidate from this heterogeneity some of these subtypes of people who have fundamentally evolved very real adaptive processes and hopefully biomarkers that can predict treatment response. So I'm going to sh particularly um, highlight one study, iSpot, which is the, the largest study in depression, um, 2,000 people, where we, we're just analysing the first 1,000 subjects. And I'm going to just give you a hint in the remaining 9 minutes, 48 seconds that I have to speak of um, some of the biomarkers that we are starting to see um, from the study.
And also just want to thank everybody from NIMH, from the STAR-D project, especially John Rush, who's now the chairman of our scientific publication committee, in helping us design the study and implement it uh, on a global scale. So the, go the notion is that the, the, the biomarkers we're looking at are, of course, genomic, but also looking at structural circuits in MRI and diffusion tensor imaging, but also timing. The brain is highly interconnected, and there could be some biomarkers, as discussed this, this morning, where the dynamics, the adaptive dynamics themselves, could be a clue as to what might predispose people to re-establish their brain instability. And then, of course, the behavioral biomarkers, the cognition. So the key point I want to make before I show specifics is that we need to be really clear about the endpoints in psychiatry. So just starting at the beginning, is there a response, yes or no? And that currently is defined by the symptoms in DSM. But where it gets interesting is, are those responses different when you're looking at different types of treatment? So I'll be showing you in iSpot, we're looking at the three most commonly employed antidepressives in the United States. About 40% of this $12 billion per annum spend uh, is atelopram, Zoloft, and venlafaxine. And then, of course, the dose. So for example, in venlafaxine, under 150 milligrams, it behaves like an SSRI. But over 150 milligrams, you get the NRI kicking in. You get the norepinephrine input. Side effects, predictive, and of course, long-term remission. So looking at the database and looking at people longitudinally also becomes pretty critical. Nothing scales without standardization. And if any of you have got examples where that's the case, I'd love to hear about them. So creating a platform of this kind on a global scale was only for, the, for masochists, but now that it's done, it seems to be sort of fun. So what we did really is, is got um, key people in the, in the United States, obviously, mainly, um, thanks to Steve Kozlow, the head of the Human Brain Project at NIMH in Washington, people in Europe, people in Australia, and essentially standardized and integrated everything. So just to quickly run through the cognitive data, a lot of it was self-report, but the behavior is actually doing a cognitive task. So you can see how the person remembers, attends, processes and identifies emotion, looking at electrical brain function, speed of information processing, heart rate, brain structure, and of course, all the omics. So just quickly, to standardize means standardize. We need to have hundreds of scientists around the world who collect and do everything in an identical fashion. About a thousand decisions needed to be made over a two-year period to get everything identical. So in all the labs, in, for example, iSpot, which I'll show you, everything is done identically. So for example, just briefly in cognition, every subject gets the same activation task with the same task instruction, instructions to measure their memory, their thinking, whether they can identify emotions. And each assessment has been chosen from a cast of thousands as to the ones that have had the most robust and validated data. All goes into a big database with hundreds of thousands of data sets. So just two quick examples as I'm running out of time. One from a small study with a major pharma, and now examples of markers, biomarkers that could predict treatment response. So here's an example where a cognitive marker from assessing cognition, namely impulsivity. So just whether the patient's at baseline compared to just patients who got nothing, whether, they could, whether we could predict them post hoc as responding to an SSRI, and we had a 76% sensitivity, just whether they were impulsive or not. Another example is predicting an SNRI, venlafaxine, as to whether they had a response speed delay. So these were people just compared to average, whether they simply had a, some kind of basal ganglia and overall response speed processing delay. So these are just two examples of a non-genomic type of biomarker that could help predict direct treatment response. But let's look at some genomic examples. So non-response was associated, for example, with BDNF-MET. And there's a growing literature in that regard. And as you all know, with a serotonergic circuit of, say, amygdala, medial prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate, 
Um, and VDNF is really crucial in, in recirculating and activating uh, serotonin. But the responders, they were BDNF VAL and other gene SNPs as well, seem to be more likely to indicate that you'd respond to an SSRI. And that's consistent with other data published in the molecular psychiatry that shows that you can extract out these, just with BDNF metal valve, these hippocampal dorsolateral cortex working memory networks versus with valves, um, amygdala medial prefrontal cortex and uh, impulsivity networks. So you can start seeing the, using simple structural equation modeling, the interconnections between genes, brain, behavior that provide a more realistic likelihood of predicting a pathway, a circuit that may be disturbed by which we can predict treatment response. And iSpot, which I'll end off on, is really the much bigger study now, uh, the international study, whoops, the international study to predict treatment response in depression, and there's a similar one in ADHD. Uh, we're just processing the first thousand patients now. If, for those of you who want the details, it's published in trials, and uh, Lee Williams, our, the, our uh, chief consultant at Stanford, and John Rush, the previous PR of Star are two of the co-authors. And again, just the, the labs um, are really crucial. So for example, in our Stanford lab and other labs around the United States, the FDA are quite interested in looking at the site replication. Once you're doing subject numbers on the scale, each site becomes a kind of potential replication of the study, which is quite interesting when you get to these sorts of numbers. Unfortunately, this study alone is a, is a $20 million study, so there's just not that many that we've been able to do on the scale. And it's a really straightforward um, uh, design in terms of randomization of the three most common antidepressives used in the United States um, at baseline, all done under standard FDA sort of protocols um, to then monitor patients through a redo, re repeat evaluation at eight weeks and then monitor them um, for a year. And an example of um, the kinds of data that we're seeing is that, and this is published in the, in the Oxford University Press book on uh, personalized medicine that Steve Kozlow and myself edited, hyperreactivity of amygdala, for example, associated with SSRI response, escitalopram and sertraline, but hyporegulation of the anterior cingulate by venlafaxine. So just beginning to see that with numbers and with this confluence of biomarkers, we're starting to see some potential to predict treatment response. And uh, just to give you a, f a snapshot of the kind of data that's emerging, which is that the, the, um, the primary outcomes across these three, these three drugs are very similar um, in terms of their capacity, the improvement. So it, it augurs well for us being able to really tease out specific biomarkers. Um, here's another good example of the more anxious you are, the less likely you, you are to respond effectively on any of those three drugs. Um, and I don't have time to go into any of the others. There are about 300 scientists and multiple other studies on brainnet.net, for those of you who are interested in exploring the basic idea that scale matters, standardization has virtues, and um, and sorry, and we've got a lot of studies across disorders heading in this direction in ADD, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, that are pointing to the power of standardization, integration in these numbers um, to shed some light. I don't want to overstate the case um, in these biomarkers for treatment prediction. And we're currently now starting discussions with the FDA about um, you know, lodging some of these claims and um, certainly starting to talk to the big pharma about looking at how to use some of these biomarkers and even payers to try and help diminish treatment costs to have some evidence-based approach as to who should be prescribed some of these rather expensive medications that may not work. And I will leave it there for those of you who want to contact me or anybody from our team in San Francisco. That's our San Francisco number and that's my email address and thank you very much.